Thank you for inviting me here to speak. It's great to actually be here and speak to you all at ANSMEs and you all who are listening from maybe at a later time who can't be here today um, because you have funded me pretty much all the way through my uh, research in Warren Tate's lab and through my PhD. So it's great to yeah, see all your faces and talk to you about um, uh, I'm mainly going to be focusing on a recently published paper from this year, just a few months ago we got it published um, and it was a result of some of my PhD work which we then validated and a few authors got behind us and we uh, um, published it, do I have the date up there? Swath MS, yes. <laughs> I will do my best to explain the science behind it because, so just call me up if I'm uh, using too many scientific words and you want me to explain them a bit further, but um, we had this published a few months ago now, September. Um, this is the full mouthful of a title, a Swath MS analysis of MECFS, peripheral blood mononuclear cells, which I'll explain what they are, proteomes, um, reveals mitochondrial dysfunction. Um, and yeah, it was great to, to get it published and out there and um, it's been very well received, I think, by um, a lot of other researchers in the field. So um, that's what we're trying to do, advocate and also inform as what many is people. Um, that is the, the journal title. Um, so Translational Medicine, they, they do actually publish quite a few MECFS ME articles, but it's a broad range of topics they publish papers on um, from lots of different sort of scientific research illness fields. <laughs> um, so just to introduce our study group. We've been working with a Dunedin study group um, for 10 years now. <laughs> um, so we, for this particular study we had 11 MECFS participants and we had nine matched control participants, so the same age and same gender as our MECFS people. Um, they were all diagnosed or had their diagnosis confirmed by Dr. Ros Fallings, so we were, um, we had a very good group and this patient group we've um, been working with quite a time as I've said and we've done a number of different molecular analyses on them trying to get a whole picture of MECFS um, so we can identify some key affected areas and targets for um, maybe developing a diagnostic test or I was just wondering, is it more prevalent in Europeans? You haven't got anything other than um, in New Zealand. Anywhere, it's it doesn't seem to have a, a bias towards a particular ethnicity. In New Zealand, we don't know much about, say, the like a Maori population, um, and that may be because they're less likely to go and access help, would go to the healthcare systems and actually be diagnosed with MECFS and contribute to the statistics. Um, but it doesn't seem to have a, a, a lean towards any particular ethnicity. Um, there is a gender bias um, that has been yeah. reported, as I'm sure you know. <laughs> um, not that I know of, no, no. I'm looking occasionally to yeah. Warren and Ros to confirm. <laughs> questions for the end because we're going to have a good yes, question and there, so that'll be really good. Yes, <laughs> I can always flip back through slides if you've got any particular questions later on. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, this was our study group um, that we have been working with for a time and um, I'm going to explain uh, a few of the terms that I introduced in the title of the paper. So first off, I'll explain a little bit about what are peripheral blood mononuclear cells, because again, not, it's not a general term used. <laughs> and people might not know what they actually are when I talk about this. So we took whole blood samples from our patient group. Um, whole blood samples contain actually several different types of blood cell. Um, 
red blood cells which transport oxygen around your body, your white blood cells which are your immune cells, and your platelets which uh, respond to injury and help blood clots, um, and uh, that's essentially their role. Um, there are different types of white blood cell or immune cell, and peripheral blood mononuclear cells are two of those different types of white blood cell, so lymphocytes and monocytes. Um, they are called um, mononuclear cells because they basically the shape of their nucleus, which is the central part of their cell, is round. So it's just a morphological title given to them. And they're peripheral because they circulate around your body, so they're not concentrated in an organ or a lymphatic system or any other sort of specific part of the body. Um, so we had these whole blood samples. We wanted to isolate these peripheral blood mononuclear cells. Um, and I've got a little illustration here of how we do that. Um, you can see maybe, <laughs> maybe not the people at the back, um, PBMCs we can isolate in this little layer here after spinning down a, blood, a whole blood sample. Um, PBMCs are important obviously because they're your immune cells. They are important to your body's immunity. They um, are part of your innate and adaptive immune system. They respond to infections. So we thought they were very important for a disease like ME-CFS, of which a subgroup um, often uh, develop ME-CFS after an acute infection, for example, and are also highly susceptible to becoming ill with any illnesses that are going around, such as COVID-19. Um, Another term I used in the title was proteome, which again is a scientific term we use. Um, proteins are obviously not just what you get from your diet, they're also essential parts of your cells and your body. So if you imagine a cell as a factory, your proteins are the workers in the factory that basically keep your cells running and functioning. Um, and your cells can be specialised for different functions and so the different proteins in the cell will be also specialised towards the function of the cell. Um, and the, the proteins within the cell will also adapt to whatever is going on in the body, so environmental, external environmental stimulus, infections going on in the body, your different proteins will be expressed at different levels within your cell. Um, so a proteome is uh, taking a snapshot of all the proteins present in the cell at that time and that can give us clues about whether the cell is fighting an infection currently or is in its normal resting healthy state. Um, so we wanted to look at the proteomes of our patient group and compare them to our control group and see if we could identify any of these differences that might give us clues about specific proteins that might differ between the two groups and might be a useful diagnostic test um, in the future or um, maybe a collection of proteins that might behave differently in these cells compared to healthy control cells. Um, and here I've listed a few different ways a protein could be useful. So it could be useful for developing a diagnostic test in future. Uh, for gauging the disease severity, so um, linking it to severe, more severe symptoms and less severe symptoms. Um, um, also differentiating between relapse and recovery phases of the illness and also assessing the usefulness of potential treatments that might be developed, um, well will be developed in the next few years we hope. Um, and this <laughs> picture here is just an example of the different types of proteins that are present in your cell. So they all are very different and unique and quite bizarre looking when you look at them like this. <laughs> um, so we took our PBM cells, isolated them, and then we analysed our, um, we isolated the proteins, all the proteins we could get, and then we used the technique SWATH-MS to uh, identify and quantify all the different proteins in the cells. Um, and then another <laughs> term I will introduce to you, a bit of statistics. Um, we compared just our whole patient group to our control group and identified 60 different proteins that 
were expressed differently in our patient group compared to our study group. And then we performed to keep our study as broad as possible and not eliminate anything early on that could then go on to be useful in larger studies. Um, we performed a, a principal component analysis, or PCA. Um, this can get confusing, but it's a way, it's essentially a statistical method we use when we're looking at very large data sets with lots of different components. So we identified 2,790 different proteins in our <laughs> whole, dif uh, our whole library of proteins we then quantified and then isolated the specific different proteins between the group. So there are 2,970 different proteins that we want to look at and see which are different and which are the same. Um, and to do that, we can uh, identify principal components. So you've got your whole data set, all your 2,970 different proteins, and principal components are looking at that whole data set and finding patterns and correlations between some of those proteins that explain as much of the variation that you see in the data set, but also kind of narrow it down so you're looking at fewer things and you're basically cancelling out all the proteins that haven't actually changed at all between the two groups. And it allows us to really clearly see uh, whether some samples are more similar to other samples or whether they're different. So we end up with a figure like this, where we have our patients in red and our controls in blue. And depending on where they are on the figure, we can say that these patients up here are more similar to each other than they are to all of our controls, which clustered quite close together down this bottom half of the figure. And so we're able to isolate nine patients who were more similar to each other, or at least very different from our controls, and then further look at the proteins that are different between those nine patients and our nine controls, and maybe increase the number of proteins that we could find that were different between the two groups that might give us more clues about what is going on in MECFS. Hopefully that's making some sort of sense. Um, we took those two principal components, so PC1 and PC2, and we performed a validation test. So this is using those two principal components as a model to then see if we can go back to that original study group and if we leave one of those people out, if we can predict accurately just using those principal components, those patterns of proteins we've identified to either decide whether they're a patient or a control. Um, and we found our principal components, our patterns of proteins. We're actually very good at differentiating whether a person was a patient or control accurately. So we had two controls who were inaccurately identified as MECFS and 10 of our 11 patients and we had all of our controls, well, minus those two, so seven of our nine controls who were accurately predicted as being our healthy controls and only one patient. So it meant we could have confidence in our principal components that they were very good at picking up differences between the two groups in our two different proteome sets. And just to quickly go back to this figure, those two controls that were called or predicted to be patients are actually very close to our cutoff line where we group, uh, decided where our two groups were. And this is our patient who was said to be a control who's actually sitting very close within the rest of the control group. Um, again, apologies to everyone sitting at the back who probably can't see that as clearly. <laughs> um, so after our principal component analysis, we compared our, I know, <laughs> Don't worry about reading any of the names. Um, this is just an um, illustration slide that I'll get into a little bit further. Um, so we compared those nine patients that we found from our principal component analysis to our nine controls, 
And after doing that, we then identified 99 proteins that were differently expressed between our two groups. And this is them. Um, on the left, we have increased proteins. So these proteins are all higher in MECFS than they are in our control group. And these proteins here are decreased in our MECFS group compared to our controls. Um, and this figure here is all the lines connecting the proteins is indicating that they have a functional relationship. So they might be involved in the same um, factory pathway, <laughs> performing a similar role in the cell and contributing to the same outcome. Um, so some interesting things that we noticed was um, a group of histone proteins here, I know I'm getting in the way of the video, um, <laughs> histone proteins. Histone proteins um, modify your DNA and they can influence which genes are expressed and which genes are not expressed. Um, some proteasome proteins, all kind of functionally linked around here. Um, your proteasome, importantly, deals with getting rid of damaged proteins in the cell. Um, so it degrades damaged proteins um, and gets rid of them because damaged proteins obviously don't function as they should. Um, and there are also, somewhere in there, here, um, a group of mitochondrial proteins. And um, as I will start explaining now, mitochondria are known as the powerhouses of the cell. So they produce all the energy by which your cells function and run and live. <laughs> um, so this is just a picture of a cell um, showing some of the main components of a cell. Um, and each cell has several mitochondria, these little <laughs> objects here. Um, this is a zoomed in look to the mitochondria and it produces ATP, um, better known as energy. <laughs> Um, that the cell then uses to carry out all its reactions. Um, so mitochondria, not only do they produce the energy by which your cells run, um, but they also are involved in several different pathways. They're involved in inflammation and your immune response. They're involved in normal cell death pathways, so your cells are constantly recycling themselves to keep you healthy. Um, they're involved in cellular senescence. Um, that is, it can be related to age and it can also be related to damage to if the cell is under stress or infected or um, just over time if there's, as you accumulate damage to your cellular DNA, cells can start to shut down um, and still be present but no longer replicate themselves. Um, they make energy and they also produce reactive oxygen species, which I will be discussing a bit later as well. So reactive oxygen species are little molecules. They are very highly reactive. They are produced in large amounts by the mitochondria and they can actually do damage to proteins, to DNA and to the mitochondria itself. So there is a whole system in your cells to keep that in balance. So make sure that those reactive oxygen species are kept at a safe level so your cells don't get too much damage. But it's a natural byproduct of the energy production pathway. So they're uh, necessary for signaling, but you don't want too many of them. Um, zooming into this sort of squiggly part of the mitochondria, which is called the cresta, um, I'm going to show you this next. Oops this next slide, which is looking at the actual machinery that makes ATP in the mitochondria within those little squiggly <laughs> bits that I showed you before. Um, so there are five very important complexes. Um, your food gets broken down into acetyl-CoA, which enters the citric acid cycle. Um, it gets broken down further and fed into the mitochondrial inner membrane, the squiggly little bits in the cell, uh, in the organelle. Um, and then these go along this chain of, along these chains of complexes um, 
and get reduced, which is, uh, and eventually end up as um, water and carbon dioxide. Um, along the way, reactive oxygen species are being made by some of these complexes. Um, and also, hydrogen is being pushed through to this side of the membrane. So these three complexes push hydrogen from one side to the other, and they create a gradient. So there's lots of hydrogen on this side, not much here. Um, and that forces, once you get to complex five, the hydrogen gets forced back down into this side and through a series of biochemical reactions, ATP is made. So that's a kind of brief illustration of how that works. Why I'm showing you this is because um, some of the proteins we found that were different, higher in MECFS and lower in MECFS are involved in these complexes and in the ATP production pathway. Um, again, I won't go into all of what all of these proteins are, just to show you that we found differences in MECFS compared to our controls in all of these proteins, all of them related to the complexes, complex 1, complex 3, complex 4 and complex 5, um, and to the stress response. So the mechanism in place to control all those reactive oxygen species that are being made, um, the citric acid cycle which feeds into the mitochondria and then gets eventually converted to ATP, um, and the mitochondria in itself, so the structural integrity of the mitochondria and how it functions. Um, and just to kind of link back, that back to the previous slide, overall we see Increases in some complex 5 proteins, increases in uh, citric acid cycle, increases in complex 1 in particular. Complex 1 is responsible for making most of the reactive oxygen species in the mitochondria and also increases in or effects on our uh, reactive oxygen species stress response pathways. So we're seeing some very clear dysregulation of mitochondrial normal function in these cells. Um, just last year, Dr. Paul Fisher in Australia um, published a paper, actually he published it at the beginning of this year eventually, um, but he presented it first last year, um, proposing a mitochondrial dysfunction theory which our results have tied in very strongly to. Um, he has uh, done studies on mitochondrial lymphocytes um, and he's looked at how the mitochondria specifically functions and he's found or he's proposed that there is a deficiency in complex 5, complex 5 that produces ATP um, and that has been compensated for by an upregulation of the previous complexes in that chain particularly in complex one, which again we have also seen. Um, and this he's just seeing in cells at resting cells, so not cells after you have done intense exercise or um, under stress essentially. These are just your resting cells, so he's seeing this deficiency in complex five, and I'll just skip to the, the slide here a reduction in ATP production that has been compensated for by increases in complex one to keep that system going to try and compensate for there being less ATP being made. If complex one in particular is being increased then there's obviously going to be an increase in reactive oxygen species being produced and this leads to oxidative stress from the cell because those reactive oxygen species then go off if they're too high, at too high level, they will go off and do damage to parts of the cell and to the mitochondria. So it's like a cycle where when the reactive oxygen species are too high, they're actually doing damage to the mitochondria and to this pathway itself. So you can see how um, that can have a negative impact on a cell and its normal function. Um, complex one is also involved in this cristae formation.
So this structure is actually very important to proper production of ATP. And if, it, if all those molecules are imbalanced, there's too much of one or not enough of another one, the structure doesn't get formed properly. And so that again will affect ATP production. So our results have very closely aligned with his theory. Um, and we published on this in our <coughs> paper. We also have um, Dr. Robert Naveau, who has provided a possible and uh, proposed a possible explanation for this deficient ATP production in MECFS. So broader, still centering on the mitochondria, but also looking at the whole cell itself. Um, he sort of came onto the MECFS scene back in 2016 published a paper looking at the metabolome of MECFS patients and he proposed, well he discovered, their group discovered, that um, the metabolome suggested that MECFS cells were in a state similar to hibernation, like a bear goes into hibernation in winter, so they're functioning at a lower energy level than healthy cells. Um, and he has gone on to focus on mitochondria as a reason for that, um, and proposed this cell danger response as uh, the term to describe what is going on in MECFS cells. So your mitochondria act as a very sensitive uh, sensor of the environment and chemicals and infections. They respond to all of those things. Um, so when they're exposed to an infection or stress event on the cell, um, they can kind of get locked into this impaired response or this, uh, I guess, this ongoing response to cellular damage that may not still be present. The infection may pass, but the mitochondria is still behaving as if there is an ongoing, it's persisting with all the signals to the rest of the cell that there is um, an attack on the cells itself. And so then you will get this persisting refocusing of the mitochondrial function to not just normally produce ATP, um, but to increase all of its component productions and keep on producing reactive oxygen species um, and that can lead to chronic illness, chronic inflammation and chronic illness. So it's a holistic theory that might explain or might tie into what we're finding with our mitochondrial dysfunction um, findings, both us and Paul Fisher. Um, so it's, it's very exciting as a scientist when you uh, researching an illness, especially MECFS, where we're still trying to find uh, consistent results amongst different researchers when we get corroboration with different groups. So um, we're very excited about the fact that we have um, found some agreement between us and Paul Fisher and even us and Dr. Robert Naveau and his focus on mitochondria. So I think it's a very promising avenue and it's leading on to some very exciting things in Warren's lab over the next few years, <laughs> next year at least, and hopefully far beyond. Um, and speaking of Warren, because my talk is now coming to an end, um, I would like to say a special thank you to him and to his group. Um, I have been with them for 10 years, um, which is a long time, and it's been an amazing start to my scientific career. Um, I feel very honoured. <laughs> um, he's been a wonderful mentor. Um, and MECFS will always be, hold a special place in my heart. And as a young scientist, it can be a challenge to step out on your own. But I've had a very good starting platform and I hope to come back to MECFS in the future as well. Um, <laughs> as soon as we can get some good, solid funding. <laughs> um, and thank you too to Anne Mees. Again, you have been um, instrumental to my PhD and all of the work in our lab. Um, you've been the primary funders of most of the research in our lab and um, all of these publications and results we've found were not 
we wouldn't have been able to do it without um, the support. So uh, thank you very much. <laughs>